ああ、ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。ああ、ああ。
So hi everyone. Uh, while we are waiting, if anybody would like to unmute and talk about how your experience has been of attending the workshops, what are you looking for from today's session? We can have a conversation. So, um, send them. Are the other resource, uh, resource person joining? Okay. Yeah, they'll join soon. Uh, so please ask them to join because uh, later they may be, uh, if it is full, then they might have some okay. problems entering. Okay. Right, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Hi, Pritha. <clears throat> Hi, Ananya. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good, good. All set? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Okay, I think we have... Am I a host also, Shantan? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. You are. Okay, great. Okay, great. <clears throat> you should be a co-host at least, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> that's good. I'll just be back in a moment. Sure. Uh, Pritha, could you check if you are also a co-host? Uh, Possibly you are, but just... Give yes, I am. Yes, I am. Great. Great. Okay. So, um, everyone, while we are waiting um, to get started, can all of you confirm if you've received the worksheet for today? <coughs> okay. 
once again has everybody received the worksheet for today <coughs> yes fantastic Vidhan, you have, have your hand up. Uh, would you like to say something before we get started? All right. Probably not. <clears throat> Hello, Pritha, Pritha Chakravati, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Shamalina. Yeah. How is the weather there? Um, it's raining here in our place. Oh, wow. I mean, I'm okay. that's, that's such a relief <laughs> to hear from me. We wished. Yeah. <laughs> I am in Hyderabad and at this oh, moment, I Hyderabad see. is a hellhole. Hyderabad I is see. where hellfires have risen and we are all getting roasted. I think Pune is not very different. Possibly yeah, same, 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 same condition. Yeah, so just a little were... more humid. Than we were wondering uh, in the morning whether we should wear some kind of warm clothes. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice weather here. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I was in Bangalore a few days back and I was mesmerized by the weather. Like 15 minutes of heat and then beautiful hour long rain. So at, at least in Hyderabad, I'm getting nicely roasted. Okay, Prasanta Barik also says heavy rain with storm here. Somebody uh, please send some rains this side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Chennai, Chennai is also yeah. back to being, let's say, more than a little warm. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Das Gupta. Good afternoon, yeah. Chamma. <clears throat> How, how is it going for everyone? Uh, uh, did you uh, send our message about possibly joining from uh, computers if possible? Did you get any responses on that? We yeah. did it yesterday. Um, we didn't get any response, but we are hoping that people are joining on computers. Yeah, because it's, I think, a little easier to participate with the kind of uh, work that we are doing. If anybody wants to unmute and speak at this point, uh, talk about their experience. I mean, we have another minute or so. So <clears throat> if you've been attending the workshop so far, um, you know, if say, uh, you know, what you're finding useful or not, or what has been your difficulty with anything, we'd love to hear that because then we can make changes in whatever remaining workshops we have. Uh, if you're joining in from uh, phones, for example, you know, what is the challenge in the way that we're doing it? And if what would help you if, if you're unable to join from a laptop or a desktop and can only do it from a phone, then if you have any ideas about us doing things a little differently, that would help. We'd love to hear that as well. Yeah, I asked some of my um, colleagues um, from other departments um, and uh, somebody from like education or sociology, um, I think they um, find some difficulty in relating to this uh, aspect of close reading because they are not acquainted with them, acquainted mm -hmm. with these kind of, uh, but anyhow, uh, uh, if uh, there could be some aspects incorporated from other like 
Well, today you're going to get yeah. science. <laughs> you're going so, to get more of science today. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like Ananya said, can we get a hands up of how many people are scientists here or working in the sciences? You can raise hands, type in the chat, unmute and shout out your name, just to get a quick hunch of how many of you work in the sciences or have worked in the sciences or would like to work in the sciences. Come on, I can't be the only person who's from the sciences here. I'm sure there are more people who've been in the sciences, right? Yesterday, we had a chemistry faculty come in uh, at the end of the workshop. Is she here today? I think you're talking about uh, Shana's. Yeah. yeah, I think she was. Yeah, she is there. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, a lot of uh, people have got involved in like uh, the IQSC related work. So we have to submit the AQR report. Mm -hmm. first. So unfortunately, many of them got involved in that work. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So we'll start because see the way that we have planned these workshops, uh, the idea is that we look at different disciplines, what they're doing and see that you know, what of that can be applicable in our own work. So you said something about education faculty and sociology faculty not being familiar with close reading, and we know that. But close reading, especially as we saw an anthropologist do it with the work of biology, tells us that that's a useful skill to learn. And if this is your first introduction to it, then that's something to look out for, because that is one way in which we write up research. And today, Shantan's talk is going to talk, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into some of the details of, you know, writing it up and how you line all of that up. So you, we may find that, I mean, we are looking at how different skills, common denominator, right? So close reading is a common denominator, as uh, Shantan's talk will also bring through some. So even if there aren't very many science faculty here today, Going through that will help us understand what some of those cross currents are and how we can learn from each other. So it doesn't matter. I think uh, we can start and let's see what we learn from Shantan's workshop today. Is that all right, Shamalim? Yeah, of course. Sure. So let me start uh, because it's already. Okay. So. Welcome to all the participants. Uh, very good afternoon. And uh, today we have Sandan Datta as the speaker. Uh, let me give a brief uh, introduction. Sandan Datta, our faculty teaching associate at the Center for Writing and Pedagogy, Korea University. Initially trained as a neuroscientist at the University of Hyderabad and the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Hyderabad. They now deep their feet in science writing, communication, and journalism. They're also associated with the feminist multimedia science collective, thelifeofscience.com, and they write at the intersections of science, health, caste, gender, and sexuality. So the topic of this lecture is a trail of evidence leading to the argument. So with this brief introduction, we can um, like start the session, I now request Sandan Datta to start the lecture. Thank you. Thanks for that glowing introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen and please let me know once you see my screen. <clears throat> um, all of you have also had a worksheet circulated, so I hope you have your worksheet open beside you. The basic logistics remain the same. Please keep yourselves muted for the duration of the workshop. But as I invite responses, or as I invite all of you to participate by either reading or commenting on some aspects of the slides, please do unmute yourself, participate. And participation is crucial to the success of this workshop. Um, 
broadly what i'll be talking about today is the idea of evidence and how we can line up evidence to arrive at an argument and the reason why we want to spend some time thinking about evidence is because evidence is crucial to academic writing no piece of academic writing in any discipline happens without putting together evidence and an argument that is derived from evidence so we do want to spend some time thinking about evidence and spending some time thinking about how we write evidence but before that what we also need to understand is the research process that generates this evidence the the act of generating evidence is what a large chunk of our research process is dedicated towards and with that i'd like to pose a question to all of you that all of your active researchers either early career mid career or established researchers what are the challenges that you face in writing research papers from the research work that you've done so if completed your research work and now you're sitting down to write your research paper what are the challenges that you face and i'd request dr pritha chakraborty to read out some responses if they come in probably everyone is still warming up yeah no it's fine we don't really need to worry about having absolutely accurate responses these are personal questions in some sense because everybody yeah. will have different problems so we started getting answers uh, daisy says understanding the existing literature anusha says articulating and structuring the data polomi says too much information and data to process uh deepthi says articulation uh fatima says bringing together all the information uh niketa says figuring out the essence to focus on uh someone then, said something about literature yes yeah, yeah, literature yes. and daisy said understanding the existing literature Mm -hmm. i'll just rephrase it a little yeah. bit to say yeah. that at the writing stage it is possibly organizing the literature right 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 much as probably not as much about understanding because that happens before you begin your research or during the research process right, but right at the stage of writing it is possibly the question of organizing yeah and yeah. literature review too is uh, as prashanta Absolutely. points out here mm -hmm. uh, yeah. we also have uh, what to focus on <clears throat> what yeah, to focus right, on yeah right. that is very important uh namita says how to start yes that's absolutely a lot of us struggle with that how to start yeah that blank document it's so scary <laughs> so are there any more responses mm. um but this is actually great i mean even if you if we just look at the list that's on the screen right now you will see that a chunk of the problems that we are facing is in question of organizing Right. we are not able many of us and it's not just the group of people who are here but researchers all over the world anybody who's done research knows that organization is one of the biggest roadblocks and challenges to constructing a paper out of the enormous amount of data that you have generated as a researcher right. so then if i could interrupt with a two more interesting yeah responses. one is structuring the narrative polomi says structuring the narrative to arrive at a relevant argument right and uh, prashanto says framing research design also so at the level of writing uh, when we are writing up from the experiment uh, or we are writing up uh, after like uh, however we collected our data that research design how do we now go back and articulate that what framework that was as we are writing i think that's a very good point also samir says uh, to establish exactly how your line of argument is building on existing literature on the topic very good so that actually ties together several exactly points. exactly yes. excellent yes okay shantan go ahead yeah yeah i'm just typing this out it's yeah. very important 
great and like like we were saying right a lot of this actually falls under the process of organizing and <clears throat> a large part of the workshop today is actually going to answer some of these questions that have been raised be it the question of using a narrative to arrive at a relevant argument be it the question of tying up existing literature and the novel findings of the current researcher in question or be it the question of transforming a lot of data to something that's a lot more coherent and uh shantan sorry to interrupt but i think this is something very important and we should uh, look at it how to distinguish writing a research paper from doing research if it is feasible how to distinguish writing a research it's paper from... the thunder from out yeah. of... <laughs> i know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's why i thought like at the outset i'll acknowledge this uh, and hope to find the answer by the end of the workshop yeah. so no, let's not is... interrupt shantan yeah, any more yeah pick up these no, questions no. these are all absolutely fabulous responses hmm. actually yeah no i'm really glad because this is so much of my presentation already and i do hope we can continue communicating to everybody who's responded thank you for doing that i hope yeah. we can continue communicating and maybe we'll add more insights as we as we go along so mm -hmm. as you've already noticed in all the workshops uh, from kriya cwp team right now our method is actually very simple we go back to exemplary texts and we want to understand how to write from the act of reading from the act of closely looking at exemplary texts and that's what we are going to do now and because we were talking about producing a research paper from the existing research from research that we've done let's actually look at a paper and this is a cell paper that's already been used by ananya in a previous workshop and for those of you who know you'd know that cell is one of the most highly impactful journals in the world definitely in the field of life sciences it's extremely extremely well known and this is an extremely relevant paper as we speak in the middle of the pandemic so my my question is simple which is if you look at the slide and the images that are on the slide what do you notice what are the elements that start popping out immediately again there's no right or wrong answer so just give it a skim and you might very well start answering okay maybe we can start off with the kriya cwp team shouting out some things that you observe yeah the and title then, of the the title of the journal cell we can see that immediately lots comes of, up yeah lots of names with numbers yeah. next to them lots of yeah. names with numbers next to them wonderful um, anybody now participants do you observe something more we started off so there's names of institutions polomi is saying wonderful Anusha says plenty of scientists. Uh, Samin, Nikita, they point out that these are authors and institutions they are affiliated with. Wonderful, wonderful. So hang on to that thought. So what we do see is that here's a relatively short paper. It's only a six-page long paper, and it's extremely rare that a journal like Cell will publish a six-page long paper. cell papers are very very long sometimes they actually go up to 30 pages 35 pages excluding the references but we see even for a six page paper this has about 13 authors coming from about 12 institutions in europe primarily from germany berlin and russia which brings us to the first aspect of research which is its collaborative nature we cannot ignore the fact that research in today's world is extremely collaborative particularly scientific research where collaboration is the crux of doing research there it is almost inexistent that you will find a science paper with just one author to it now what about this slide and there's some text there are two graphs but um, pritha might i request you to read the text sure uh, sars s engages 
angiotensin converting enzyme 2 that is ACE2 as the entry receptor uh, Lee et al 2003 and employs the cellular serine protease TMPRSS2 for S protein priming uh, Glowaka et al 2011 Matsuyama et al 2010 Shula et al 2011 Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure um, even so the content, I'll just try to briefly talk so that we are all on the same page about what it is saying. It is saying that there is a particular virus called SARS-S, which by the way is not the COVID-19 virus that we're talking about. What it, we know that it engages with, which means it essentially physically connects with this enzyme called ACE2, which acts as its receptor for entry into the cell. And this process involves a particular molecule called TMPRSS2. That's essentially what this sentence is saying. Um, but what are the things that you notice on this slide, including the text that we just read out, the graphs out here, and there's this nice list of a couple of things that we don't yet know what they are. And media graphs, graphs, so graphs, graphs, graphs. We start noticing graphs. Wasif says intimidating at that. <laughs> Very <laughs> agreed. <laughs> graphs can indeed be intimidating. It's interesting that the purpose of graphs is to actually make intimidating numerical data into less intimidating visual data. <laughs> Ananya, uh, you're muted. muted. You should do a workshop with us on graphs at some point, but that's another story. I uh, I noticed that the verb engages in the SARS S engages tells me that this is about process, perhaps. Exactly, you're correct. This is talking about process. But Ananya, do you notice something more Anush, in, the, in uh, the text? Can I read out some from the chat meanwhile? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Anusha says bibliographic references like Glowaka et al. Exactly. Polomi points out the et al hinting to collaborative work again. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. Now, what do citations indicate in academic writing? So we see there are citations which are in text, like this one. And we see that these citations are going to eventually appear <clears throat> in the work cited list or the reference list at the end of the paper. But why do we cite? What does a citation indicate? Existing literature. Wonderful. Uh Wonderful. So what we do know then that there are two distinct components, even in the evidence that the paper is using. One is the fact that there is some pre-existing literature, pre-existing work that has already been done, which is important to the current work, as is evident through the use of citations and references. And then let me tell you that these graphs indicate data from the authors themselves, the current paper that we are reading, which is Hoffman et al. 2020. These two graphs are results from the work that the authors did in their own lab. So this tells us that there are two, at least two kinds of evidence that people bring into their work. One is pre-existing evidence, which is evidence that has been generated by others before we embark on our research journey. And then there is evidence that we generate as researchers while doing our own work. And at this moment, having read the science paper, we see things that have popped out. We see that it's a collaborative effort. There's a title and the title is very interesting because the title gives us what the paper is arguing right at the beginning. It tells us that there are 13 authors in about 12 institutes that have participated in the research. It tells us that there is some pre-existing work that is interest that is important to the current work. There's some new data that has been generated and everybody has been credited both in text and in the work cited list at the end. Now, uh, Shantan, yeah. Nikita points out something and maybe this is something we can take up later also. 
which is about i am not sure about science papers but social studies bibliography gives me some idea about the politics of the author yeah that's a very very interesting question yeah. let us actually take it up a little later exactly yeah it's a great great question thank you just flagging it that. yeah absolutely yeah now let us try to see the the as we read the scientific research paper what is the process that starts emerging so once again ananya i'd request you to read the first block of text if it's visible yeah yeah it is it is oh. in december 2019 a new infectious respiratory disease emerged in wuhan hubei province china huang et al 2020 wang et al 2020 zu et al 2020 an initial cluster of reference uh, initial cluster of infections was linked to hunan seafood market potentially due to animal contact subsequently human to human transmission occurred chan et al 2020 and the disease now termed coronavirus disease 19 covid 19 rapidly spread within china should i read the second one as well not not right away but thank you okay. so much okay. so this is actually from at the very beginning of the paper this is probably the second paragraph where what the authors are essentially doing is that they are telling us how did this paper come into existence and it's no wonder that scientists biologists virologists especially a pandemic was raging and they started noticing the pandemic and much like scientific inquiry begins it starts with observation of natural phenomena and here you see a natural phenomena that of the pandemic happening but notice that even here you see people who have characterized the pandemic and who have characterized the human to human transmission occurring in the pandemic these are things that have already been done and the authors make it clear um samir might have request you to read the second block of text Sure. Uh, a novel coronavirus, SARS coronavirus two, SARS CoV two, which is closely related to SARS CoV, was detected in patients and is believed to be the etiological agent. It's sorry, etiologic agent of the new lung disease. Zhu et al. 2020. Thank you so much, Samir. So here, what the authors are telling us that somebody called Zhu and colleagues have already identified the causing agent, the causative agent of this pandemic. So COVID nineteen is caused by a virus called SARS CoV two, and we already have an idea about SARS CoV two. So now that there is a pandemic and there is something causing the pandemic, and you know these two information, what do you think is the next logical question that one should ask? and please feel free to type your responses the disease okay the effects of the disease is one question but we do know that it's a lung disease so there is a respiratory issue that is coming up it's a new infectious respiratory disease so the effects of the disease have in some way already been found and in fact the way people understand it is a pandemic is when the effects of the disease start showing first and the pc says how to control it how to control it is a great point but there's a step before that before we can step into controlling the disease there's, there's something that's missing so all we know right now is that there is a respiratory pandemic and there's a organism which is causing this respiratory uh, pandemic and then there is something called cure but there's something missing and how much it will spread in the real world very important question but still doesn't take us to the idea of cure uh how is it different from what we know about sars cov fantastic fantastic point so yeah so now let's try to understand from that question so what is it that you're trying to say when you're saying that how is this different from sars cov and my yeah, no please go ahead do we have any previous work on study on it how the transfer new... of the virus takes place 
Great. So now if I was to put together some of these questions, the broad question that emerges is how does this causative agent cause the infection? At this moment, and you know, it's great that we've actually broken this big question down into smaller questions, which is the question of, is there a similarity between another causative agent? And these are actually very valid processes. But the big question that emerges if we were to put these together is how does SARS-CoV-2, which is, by the way, a novel coronavirus, which answers, somebody said whether we know much about this virus. We don't because it is a novel coronavirus. How does SARS-CoV-2 cause an infection? Everybody agrees that this would be a logical question to ask once you've identified the causative agent and the fact that there's a pandemic going on. Okay, so here is how reading the paper tells us that the SARS-CoV-2, how, how is it causing an infection? And you see that there's a pre-existing information, something that researchers already know, is that SARS-CoV, the virus that we already knew is less infectious, is non-pandemic causing. It infects via this molecule called ACE2. Then these researchers step in and they give us three pieces of evidence, one after the other. One says SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. So the old coronavirus and the novel coronavirus infect the same cells. It is not that SARS-CoV is infecting kidneys and SARS-CoV-2 is infecting lungs. Both of them are infecting the same cells. <clears throat> Then they say SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 have the same motifs, same structural sequences that are required to bind to this receptor. And remember, that's a question of engagement. So there's physical contact that has to happen, which means whatever is required for this physical contact, we call it motifs, are present in both SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. And then they say that if you increase the amount of ACE2, the receptor in cells, and then you spread some viruses on them, it looks like the infection by SARS-CoV-2 is much higher. So there's a positive correlation, a direct link between the amount of ACE2 and the amount of virus. If we were to put both the pre-existing information, if we were to put both the pre-existing information and the new information together, we understand that SARS-CoV-2 probably infects via ACE2. This is an indication that ACE2 is the molecule that is being used by SARS-CoV-2 to infect cells. And <clears throat> if I were to map it out in terms of structure, in terms of how evidence has been lined to lead us to an argument, we see that prior evidence followed by novel evidence one, novel evidence two, novel evidence three, leading us to an argument. Right. And I hope everybody is with me on this. Is are there any questions with respect to the mechanism? Are there terms that I couldn't explain properly? But at least I, I hope that everybody understands that there's an element of prior information and there's an element of novel information, which seems to have been put together very neatly. It's one after the other, leading us to an argument. So then my question is. Where is all the problems that we were talking about? Where is the mess that we started with? And is the process of research so neat, so sorted? Because when I read the paper, there is no mess. It's all step one, step two, step three, step four, argument. And there's only one way to reach at that argument. Any, any comments at this point of time? No. Especially from people who have done sciences or been in the sciences, do you really think that scientific research looks so neat? Because the paper gives me an impression that it is neat. And at this moment, everything looks very sorted. So is it just us who have so much mess to deal with and so much data to generate? And, and I'll answer that right away to say that that's not true. And hopefully over the rest of the presentation, we are going to see that writing is the process that will help us generate neatness, generate coherence as we deal with the mess of data and evidence that we have generated. 
Uh, Shanta, but, there's a question from Ponomi. Yes, yes. What does the word motive mean in the second evidence? This is the previous right. slide, I believe. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, remember that there has to be a physical contact that has to happen between the ACE2 receptor and the virus. And, you know, the virus has a protein that juts out like a spike. So it's called a spike protein. So motifs is the structure of the protein, the part of the protein that is required to build this physical contact. Um, does that explain, does that answer your question, Polumi? Yeah, thanks. Okay, wonderful. Now, what I do want to think about a little bit is, you know, shift the discipline a little bit, not just the discipline. We see a different paper that you've already encountered, Emily Martin's The Egg and the Sperm, um, there are a couple of differences between the cell paper and Emily Martin's paper. First, that the cell paper, like all of you have rightly pointed out, has several different authors from several different institutions. Martin's paper is a single author paper. The cell paper is a science paper, while Emily Martin is an anthropologist who's reading scientific texts. Cell paper is a relatively shorter paper, so it's only six pages. While Emily Martin's paper is about 15 pages or so, it's much longer in size. And we want to also see whether the elements that we identified from a research paper, the idea about research being collaborative, the idea about different kinds of evidence being present, the idea about citations, do these elements change as we move from a discipline to another and we move from a genre to another and as we move from an author to the other? So I'm just going to move to the next slide and I'd like you to take some time to skim over this slide. Um, there's quite some stuff happening here, but a um, couple of things that I would like to point out is that here's the title and subtitle, here's the author's name. This is a body paragraph. There's some stuff that I've underlined in red and that's just to draw your attention there. And there are these two, tiny blocks of text which we call footnote because it literally appears in the footer of the paper right so you see a chotu two here you see a chotu two here so what, what are the stuff that you notice again take a minute let your eyes run over this and, and give me what's happening i think i'll start off by saying there's the title of the essay of course of course. And Ananya says it's a single author paper. It is a single author paper. Olumi notices acknowledgements. Wonderful. There's acknowledgements. And Polomi, please do hang on to that thought because I'm probably going to pick your brains in the next slide about acknowledgements. Okay, what about the red underlines? Anybody who's footnotes. sort of focusing? Sunny there are footnotes. footnotes. There are footnotes. And it's interesting because the previous paper had no footnotes. There were zero footnotes in the previous paper. In fact, science writers are discouraged from using footnotes like anything. So, what I've done here in this slide is just put some of the text together um, in a more readable fashion. And I'm going to invite um, Polomi to start reading the block of text here. The, the footnote that starts with portions. Sorry, I probably put Polomi on the spot. I'm really sorry about that. Pritha, would you like to read Yeah, it sure. Uh, portions of this article were presented as the 1987 Becker Lecture, Cornell University. I'm grateful for the many suggestions and ideas I received on this occasion. For especially pertinent help with my arguments and data, I thank Richard Cohn, Kevin Whaley, Sharon Stephens, Barbara Dutton, Suzanne Queckler, Lorna Rhodes, and Scott Gilbert. The article was strengthened and clarified by the comments of the anonymous science reviewers, as well as the superb editorial skills of Amy Gage. 
right now let's let's pause for a while like polomi rightly pointed out this is an acknowledgement footnote it's the first footnote that appears in the essay and martin is thanking and she's thanking a bunch of people she's thanking people who had attended her 1987 becker lecture for giving feedback and ideas and suggestions she's thanking another bunch of people names of which have been highlighted in green for help with arguments and data she's also thanking reviewers and the editor of the paper and this this is this is very important for us to pause on because it tells us that although martin's paper is a single author paper the research process the process of writing this paper both these processes have involved significant help from other people so much so that they've made it made it into the paper as an acknowledgement and this also tells us the very how important it is for us to take uh, into consideration feedback that comes our way as we write and as we research and the importance of the revision process in the in the process of writing um prita would you now like to read the second footnote one on the right uh the textbooks i consulted are the main ones used in classes for undergraduate pre medical students or medical students or those held on reserve in the library for these classes during the past few years at johns hopkins university these texts are widely used at other universities in the country as well right so here martin is telling her what her sources are what her primary source for research is and we are told that the primary source for research is these textbooks that are used in pre medical um, undergrad pre medical medical schools or um, even people who are pursuing medicine read these textbooks even other universities especially in the life sciences departments often use these textbooks so martin is going to consult these textbooks as her primary sources um prita once again third requesting block, you yeah. to read the the third block of text sure in 1948 in a book remarkable for its early insights into these matters ruth hershberger argued that female reproductive organs are seen as biologically interdependent while male organs are viewed as autonomous operating independently and in isolation at present the functional is stressed only in connection with women it is in them that ovaries tubes uterus and vagina have endless interdependence in the male reproduction would seem to involve organs only right and this is from a body paragraph that is talking about the difference between how science textbooks represent male and female reproductive systems and reproductive processes and here she is drawing from the work of another scholar directly the scholar's name is ruth hershberger and this is what would constitute a secondary source a source who has already done some work and you're incorporating the sources work directly into your work now what i would like you to pay attention is that while i was talking about the science paper i was using the term evidence but while i'm talking about emily martin's paper i'm using the word source and i want you to find and then if i could just interrupt you for one second uh before you get on to the source and evidence wasif had raised a very interesting question about the process of research and the writing up of research are they the same thing and i think here you know the question that you left us with that you know in the final polished paper that gets published the messiness of the research process and the writing that will involve including that of drafting it's kind of hidden and in the science paper you can't tell at all in fact that's not uh, there's no hint to it but in in the kinds of disciplines that allow and the kinds of publications that allow footnotes some of that process gets hinted at here in the footnotes so the fact that she's thanking anonymous science reviewers and the superb editorial skills of amy gage tells us what that it required editing re-editing uh polomi said that it also tells us that she started this paper thinking about presenting this paper in 1987 and all these people have been involved 
So some of that process, Vasip, notice how some of that process is getting hinted at. If you unpack this, then you can get a sense for you know, the long time it took, the many iterations it took from lecture to other things um, before she got it to this final polished place. So a hint of the process in that uh, is something that these footnotes are allowing. Uh, just wanted to make that clear because Vasip's question sort of asked it. Uh, no, that's very helpful, Ananya. Thank you. Yeah. So now, from the discussion that we've had, and what we've essentially done is we've looked at two papers, identified certain common elements that seem to be spread across the papers, which is the idea of evidence, the idea of argument, um, the idea of feedback and revision, the idea of collaboration, and certain differences, which is the fact that some work has many, many authors, some work can be single author. There are different genres of academic writing. If we are to put these together, a couple of important questions have emerged in, in front of us. One is, what does this tell us about the research process? Second, and like I had, like I just pointed out, what is the difference between source and evidence? Why is it that I call some things in Martin's paper sources while I call certain piece of data in the science paper pieces of evidence? And then how does lining up evidence lead us to an argument? And the first question we've already had some idea. We understand that the research process is inherently messy. And in fact, just to share an anecdote, um, like Shamulima said in the beginning, I'm a science journalist and I'm writing about science papers all the time. And we have what is called an interview cheat sheet. It's just a sheet that you sit beside with when you talk to these scientists who have written these papers and ask them questions about their research. And something that's prevalent in all interview cheat sheets is what are the problems that you faced while doing your research? Nobody asks whether you faced a problem while doing your research because it's more than an assumption. We believe that everybody faces problems while they are doing their research. So we understand that the research process is inherently messy, but we understand that the research process is translated into a more coherent process through the act of writing. We, and now we are going to get into the other two questions that, that are on the screen. One is the difference between source and evidence and how does lining up evidence lead us to an argument? So, Ananya, might I request you to read this paragraph, which has blue and yellow in it. You're muted. Ananya, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Ovulation. Okay, before I read this, there are some questions yeah. about... Um, why are some sources primary and why are some sources secondary? Uh, yeah. uh, and this might uh, make it easy for you to understand that follow me. Uh, primary sources are sources that one is directly analyzing and working with. So uh, the textbooks, the biology textbooks that the quote that Chantan used where she says that these are the kinds of textbooks that I'm going to look at, which are studied at various places. And she's and and this uh, and she's going to directly analyze that. That will be a primary source. But someone like Ruth Hirschberger, who's also looked at that sources and has some ideas about it, when she builds on that, that's a secondary source. Um, so let's see how she how this paragraph also makes it easy to understand the distinction between the two. So ovulation does not merit enthusiasm in these texts as compared to other spermatogenesis. Textbook descriptions stress that all of the ovarian follicles containing ova are already present at birth. Far from being produced as sperm are, they merely sit on the shelf, slowly degenerating and aging like overstocked inventory. Open quote. At birth, normal human ovaries contain an estimated 1 million follicles each, and no new ones appear after birth. Thus, in marked contrast to the male, the newborn female already has all the germ cells she will ever have. Only a few, perhaps 400, 
are destined to reach full maturity during her active reproductive life. All the others degenerate at some point in their development so that few, if any, remain by the time she reaches menopause at approximately 50 years of age, close quote. Note the marked, uh, note the marked contrast, and this is in quotes, that this description sets up between male and female. The male who continuously produces fresh germ cells and the female who has stockpiled germ cells by birth and is faced with their degeneration. Martin, 487. Thank you so much, Ananya. So um, this paragraph also appears in your worksheet and I'd request all of you to spend some time reading it and then tell me, so you see parts that are highlighted in cyan and you see parts that are highlighted in yellow. Uh, my question is, what is the difference between parts highlighted in yellow and parts highlighted in cyan? You can take some time to, to read. Ritha, you can read out responses as they start coming in. Sure. So Shantan, uh, just uh, to clarify, you basically want to know that what is the difference between what is uh, there in the part highlighted in yellow and the other in. Correct. Okay, Fatima says Correct. the yellow highlighted text is in quotation marks. So, exactly. So the, the part in yellow, because of the quotation marks, you understand that it is a quote. It has been taken from a source. Right. Do we know uh, where the quote is from? Yeah, I think uh, while copy pasting the reference got um, became a exclamation mark out there, but yeah, there should be a footnote here. Polumi has a response. Yeah. The Paulami says that uh, the cyan part is the analysis, uh, Emily Martin's analysis, interpretation of the quote and connecting it to her larger argument. Okay. Um, anybody wants to point out what the larger argument might be? Okay, let's let's take a few more responses in terms of similarities and differences. Sorry, differences between yellow and cyan. Um, Cyan is interpretative, is what uh, Anusha is saying. Correct. I mean, so it is an interpretation of the quote in some sense. It's a reading of the quotation. Sami Chopra says, the quote is used as a source. The text highlighted in cyan uses the source as evidence. Wonderful. So I guess source is what you use as information while evidence is how you present that information to make an argument. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Sami, for saying that. And that's exactly what we are going to think about in this slide. So now that we have these responses in, let me actually start reading from the part that is highlighted in Cyan, which is textbook descriptions stress that all of the ovarian follicles containing ova are already present at birth. And this is um, something that when we bring in a quote in our own work, we often start with, which is a summary. So this sentence is a summary of the quote that's going to appear next. The fact that these textbook descriptions stress 
They mention repeatedly that ovarian follicles containing ova are already present at birth. Far from being produced as sperm are, they merely sit on the shelf, slowly degenerating and aging like overstocked inventory. This is Martin talking about the court. And the part of the, uh, this part in Cyan that I've just now selected, this part is called a setup, what appears before the court. An author introduces the court in their own writing with what is called a setup. And this setup often includes a summary of the quotation that's going to come in. Remember that this summary is in context of the author's own argument. The summary is supposed to lead us to the quote and help us see the quote in the same way that the author is seeing it. Then comes the quote, which is at birth, normal human ovaries contain an estimated 1 million follicles each and no new ones appear after birth. Thus, in marked contrast to the male, the newborn female already has all the germ cells she will ever have. Only a few, perhaps 400, are destined to reach full maturity during her active reproductive life. All the others degenerate at some point in their development so that few, if any, remain by the time she reaches menopause at approximately 50 years of age. And as we've read the quote, we now see that the two sentences at the beginning, the setup was a summary of the two parts that you see in the quote. One is the fact that ovarian follicles are already present at birth and the fact that they degenerate and age like overstocked inventory. Now let me read the part that comes next. Note the marked contrast and the marked contrast is quoted from the quote that this description sets up between male and female. The male who continuously produces fresh germ cells and the female who has stockpiled germ cells by birth and is faced with their degeneration. And that quotation marks beside marked contrast should remind you of something that you witnessed yesterday, which is the act of close reading. This is actually paying attention to the quote that Martin is using to come up with an insight of your own. And this tells us, like Sami rightly pointed out, that what transforms a source into evidence are four things. One is the act of quoting itself. The moment you pick up a part from a much longer text, and remember that this is a scientific textbook. So you're actually picking a tiny part from the textbook. The act of quoting itself marks the transition from source to evidence. We also see a setup, a setup that includes some summary of the quotation in the context of what the author is trying to say we have some analysis that has been pointed out, and this analysis here is through close reading of the text, through paying attention through the text that comes up. And this analysis has to eventually make a point. The point being ovulation does not merit enthusiasm in scientific texts as compared with spermatogenesis. So four things, the act of quoting, the setup in context of the author's own argument, analysis in a particular frame, and using that analysis to make a point makes a source into evidence. I'm just going to spend 30 seconds putting these down on the slide so that when I share the slide, um, these, these are there. And while you type it out, then I would also like to point out that the larger argument, the author's larger argument that you asked, Volomi has answered, uh, is that the language used to talk about reproductive processes uh, in scientific texts is gender biased and severely discriminatory. Correct. Absolutely. So here's what converts source to evidence. If, the, if there are any questions at this point, I'll be happy to take them. Could I make an observation quickly? Absolutely. Yesterday, uh, there was a participant, I don't know if she's here today, but uh, had said that when I was reading Emily Martin, you know, I noticed she was really funny and I was chuckling. And, and that bit of funniness and chuckling is there actually as a part of her setup. When she says, far from being produced as sperm are, they merely sit on the shelf, slowly degenerating and aging like overstocked inventory. 
Now that's not part of the quote at all, but this is a very sarcastic take on, okay, so sperm, uh, the, the, the production of sperm is this active work, whatever, but you know, eggs are just sitting there like overstock inventory. And so this is also where you hear Emily Martin's voice. Uh, we often talk about voice in writing and here is where you clearly hear her laughing and making fun and being sarcastic. And it's part of the setup and it's part of us uh, and, and it's up to us to be able to, you know, uh, notice it and see what she's doing with that. Mm, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, Ananya. But yeah, if anybody has any questions in terms of what makes source into evidence, happy to take it. Any observations, any comments at this point? So why... Can... Scientists, so this is my question. Why do scientists not call their references sources, but why is it directly evidence? No, that's great because what you see in the paper, uh, Ananya, is the post-analyzed work. So, so they are not going to show you the raw data, the numbers that they have generated. What they're going to show you is the graph, which is inherently a product of analysis. Mm. So from here... Um, as we look at Martin, we see that the act of analysis is making source into evidence. Mm. So what you see in the science paper is essentially post-analytical work. And that post-analytical work is therefore evidence. Okay. So there is evidence, both primary and secondary. So all the work that they're bringing from other people's um, previous work is also evidence, not a source, because they are not reanalyzing that work. Okay. They are directly taking the insight. Thank you. So that's secondary evidence and primary evidence. While for social sciences and humanities scholars, we often, the research process involves transforming our sources into evidence. Uh. Polumi also has a question, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, we also hear about counter evidence in Ptolemy's method of argumentation. For that as well, we need sources. Uh, could you talk about that as well? I'll, I'll try. So if I understand correctly, the Ptolemy's method of argumentation is the one where you have an argument and the author themselves think about a counter argument and then follow it up with a counter counter argument, which is often, if you notice, Polomi philosophical texts are written in the Toulmin's method, like argument, counter argument, counter counter argument, sometimes counter 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 argument, so on and so forth. And you're correct in saying that you need sources uh, for that. But uh, the question is that as you're writing, um, you've already worked with the sources and what the toolman method is making you do it's actually pushing you to imagine to speculate what an opposition somebody who's reading your work might be responding to so you're already formulating that response going back to the sources that you've worked with and building the counter argument and then for the counter counter argument you are now taking getting back into your own shoes thinking about how you would respond to this theoretical entity that is countering your argument. Again, going back to the same sources, coming up with a counter-counter argument. So you definitely need sources to form arguments. There are no arguments which are going to come up without sources. But often the work is going to be limited to the sources that you are using for the, for the piece of writing in general. And if we have read Emily Martin, and I'm hoping by now everyone has had enough time to read all the sources, there's an example of this in Martin, Martin's essay too. In another section, she is going on, she will go on to look at the texts which don't actually do this, where uh, the, the female reproductive process is not necessarily passive. And she will go to those texts as well, but then show you how they are operating off yet another stereotype. So if the uh, female reproductive process is not passive, and if it is active, then there are other negative stereotypes of domineering female presences that are also very dismissive, and that language carries that, right? Yeah. So Martin also does that. So it's here she's noticing passive uh, language of passivity. There she, in another section, she will notice that then it's, you know, Harpy and Harridan and 
uh, the, yeah. the, the, the what is the, the dominatrix, right? So another set of stereotypes that come from, so it's either passive or it's domineering in a way that makes it easy to dismiss. Oh. And also, I mean, yeah. Martin does it several times. You also see yeah. the cybernetic. So on one hand, Martin proposes cybernetic theory as a better way than reductionist science. And then later says that cybernetic imagery has its own prob problems. So yes. you see this. Um, there's another paragraph where I remember yeah. Martin yeah. says that the, uh, the proper analogy of ovulation is not sperms, but spermatogenesis. And mm -hmm. So you will see this happening constantly in Martin. What is important to notice is that uh, the different ways, so what you're essentially doing as you're moving from the argument to the counter argument column is you're changing your frame of analysis of the same source. You are changing your approach, which is leading you to an argument and then it's counter argument and then it's counter counter argument. So it's more of a, more of a framing question. But of course, you're working with sources and, and, and oftentimes you are going to use very similar strategies of analysis. Yeah, and this is useful, Polumi, because these are strategies and techniques that become useful in writing of the research, right? When you are beginning to work with evidence, what are the various ways in which you line them up? And this, you know, making sure that you are accounting for counter arguments that you know people who will read it will make is a part of the way in which you line up with it. So it's very useful that you brought this up. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any, any more questions before we move on? I do have two more exercises for us to do. All right. I'll take that silence as a no for the time being, but please feel free to raise questions during the Q&A session. Um, uh, Pritha, I'd like you to read this paragraph, please. Sure. In order to elucidate why SARS-S and SARS-2S mediated entry into the same cell lines, we next determined whether SARS-2S harbors amino acid residues required for interaction with the SARS-S entry receptor ACE2. Sequence analysis revealed that SARS-CoV-2 uh, clusters with SARS-CoV related viruses from bats, that is SARS-R-CoV, uh, SARS of which some but not all can use ACE2 for host cell entry. Figure 2A, figure S2. Analysis of the receptor binding motif, RBM, a portion of the recepting, receptor binding domain, RBD, that makes contact with ACE2, uh, Lee et al. 2005a, revealed that most amino acid residues essential for ACE2 binding by SARS-S were conserved in SARS-2S, figure 2b. In contrast, most of these residues were absent from S proteins of SARS-CoV previously found not to use ACE2 for entry, figure 2B, Geet et al. Uh, uh, 2013, Hoffman et al. 2013, uh, Manichari et al. 2020, uh, in agreement with these findings, directed expression of human and bat, uh, rhinolophus al al alcyone, uh, ACE2, but not human DPP4, the entry receptor used by MERS-CoV, Raj et al. 2013, or human APN, the entry receptor used by HCoV-229E, Eager et al. 1992 allowed SARS-2S and SARS-S driven entry into otherwise non-susceptible uh, BHK21 cells, figure 3A. Moreover, anti-serum raised against human ACE2 blocked uh, SARS-S and SARS-2S, but not VSBG or MERS-S driven entry, figure 3B. Finally, authentic SARS-CoV-2 infected BHK21 cells 
transfected to express ACE2 cells, but not parental BHK21 cells with high efficiency, figure 3C, indicating that SARS-2S, like SARS-S, uses ACE2 for cellular entry. Thank you so much, Pritha, and I'm really sorry for making you read this out aloud. <laughs> Evidently, it's not an easy task, and hence you have this stereotypical imagery of a scientist who's burying themselves into their paper rather than reading it aloud. And I'm, I'm probably glad that they do it. But anyway, what I'm going to try to do is, uh, before I you know, make all of you do the task, just sort of break this process down a little bit. You do understand this is hardly a 200-word paragraph. And in this 200-word paragraph, you have 10 different terminologies and probably 15 different citations that have already come in and science papers often look the same but let's let's let me just try an attempt and we'll see if the attempt is successful but you note that the paragraph starts by saying what the researchers wanted to do so they wanted to understand whether SARS S and SARS 2S spike protein of the previously known coronavirus and spike protein of the new novel coronavirus of COVID-19, why do they infect the same cell lines? They find that okay, proteins are made of amino acids. They find that amino acid sequences of the spike proteins are extremely similar. Um, and there's an, and they checked with it with other SARS-related COVID viruses, and they see that, okay, there's a bunch of SARS coronaviruses that use ACE2. There's a bunch of SARS coronaviruses that do not use ACE2, but use other receptors like um, human, D like DPP4, APN, so on and so forth. So now what they are going to try to do is check whether our SARS-S2, the spike protein of the new coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, whether it interacts with ACE2 or whether it interacts with what some other COVID viruses have used. So be it DPP4 or APN, that's what they do. They find that not only is there a structural similarity between the SARS-S and SARS-S2, but also a functional similarity in the sense that SARS-S2 only infects through ACE2, but not the other receptors, which is DPP4 and APN. Finally, what they do is they increase the amount of ACE2 in certain cells. By the way, BHK is baby hamster kidney cells. So you actually kill baby hamsters, take out their kidneys and then their cells. Um, but yeah, um, they actually increase the amount of ACE2 in baby hamster kidney cells, and they see that the infection by the novel coronavirus also rises, which indicates that SARS-2S, our novel coronavirus, like our old coronavirus, uses ACE2 for infecting a cell. Any questions at this point of time? At least is some of the content in this paragraph a, lot, a little more accepted, uh, accessible. Okay. Pritha, a little more accessible. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but I mean, it's okay. I, I think yeah. what is important is the structure of the sentences more than the specific content that is there. Like I can understand that sequence analysis revealed that. So that means there is a process which yeah. reveals something that is SARS-CoV-2 clusters with SARS-CoV related uh, viruses from bats. So there is something that has happened as a particular process has taken place, which has revealed something of which some, but not all can use ACE2 for host cell entry. So this is an information that is already pre-existent, which I can Wonderful. make out from the fact that the figures normally are marked as 2A, 2B, so on and so forth. But instead here it says figure S2, which is a different sequence of reference also. I guess. Fantastic. So Fantastic. I can make out like that. Maybe not the great. specificity of the content, but what exactly is happening. Great, great. No, that's wonderful. Uh, 
so as Sopolomi says, she gets the sense, Preetha says she gets the sense, and the sense actually is good enough for us to, to work with this paragraph. Vasif, I, I saw, is asking whether they could have used more sentences. Um, they could have, I doubt it would have made a lot of difference in terms of accessibility of the paragraph in general. Um, but also, you know, Cell is actually a published journal. And when I say published journal, it's physically printed. Um, some of these articles are made available online, but it remains to be a journal which is physically printed. And therefore, there's a word limit to the articles that you can write. Unless you reach out to an editor and say, I have done some Nobel Prize winning work and I want 50 pages of your journal. So sometimes people tighten these sentences so that they fit the word limit. Um, but can I come to the exercise um, and we can talk more? Uh, just one observation that I think uh -huh. uh, the sentences and what comes in brackets after that, I think is what we need to notice. Which ones have brackets? What are they saying? I think that distinction, if we can make, I think we will get it. Yeah, which belongs to the, like what the authors have done and what is pre-existing, which they are taking from other, uh, like people who have done other experiments before. So what I want you to do everyone is exactly this you have this paragraph in your worksheet and what i would like you to do is whatever part of a sentence that you think has been taken by the authors from pre-existing literature please highlight is it in green whatever you think is the author's own work information that they have generated data that they have generated please highlight it in pink and we can take about five minutes to do this, three to four minutes to do this, and then come back. And you're going to tell me what to highlight on the screen. To start you off with, I have done it for two sentences. So sequence analysis revealed that SARS-CoV-2 clusters with SARS-CoV related viruses from bats is something that the authors did themselves of which some, but not all, can use ACE2 for host cell entry, like Preetha pointed out, is coming from pre-existing literature. Then you have analysis of the receptor binding motif. What is the receptor binding motif? A portion of the receptor binding domain that makes contact with ACE2. So that part is coming. The definition of receptor binding motif has been taken from pre-existing work, has been highlighted in green. But analysis of this receptor binding motif tells us that AC2, right, the, receptor, the, the motif is same for SARS-S and SARS-2S. This is something that authors have done themselves. As long as we are equipped with an understanding of sense, an understanding of some form, we should be able to do this exercise and let us try it out. <clears throat> Shall 
Chetan, maybe you could like, you know, take us line by line and we could respond in terms of whether it is something the author is saying or it is something that is yep. coming from other sources. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yep. In just in case everybody is ready, has everybody done some highlighting already? Would you like to do this together? Daisy has already responded. With so her. let's just so let's just start reading from here, which we've not highlighted, right? So in contrast, most of these residues were absent from S proteins of SARS-CoV previously found not to use ACE2 for entry. What do you think we should highlight? Daisy what are the parts? From oh. most to uh, COV would be from other sources. So that would be in green. Are you sure, Daisy? Do you want to give it another read? Fatima says green. Green. Yes. Daisy says yes. Okay, but what about the previously found bit? Pritha, do you want to... G at all comes at the end of that question. Yeah. 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 So, so Pritha, do you want to read this sentence out again? Sure. In this, contrast, this most of these residues were absent from S proteins of SAR SR CoV. Previously found not to use ACE2 for entry. So something that has been previously found is most likely to be coming from another source. So maybe Correct. that is the part which would be uh, in green. Is, yeah, Nikita says the same thing. Whereas maybe the part before that, most of these residues is an observation from the current paper. Thank you so much. Let's try this another um, once more. In agreement with these findings, and these findings, remember, includes both what the authors have found themselves and what has been previously reported. Directed expression of human and bat ACE2. That is just a name of a bat, which we are going to ignore. In agreement with these findings, directed expression of human and bat ACE2, but not human DPP4, which is the entry receptor used by MERS-CoV or human APN which is the entry receptor used by, human, by another coronavirus, allowed SARS-2S and SARS-S-driven entry into otherwise non-susceptible BHK21 cells. So let's first figure out what or which parts of this are taken from other sources. What should we highlight in green? So we should pay attention to where the part uh, within the brackets, the citations are given maybe, right? That's a great way of looking at it. Yeah. So Nikita says uh, DPP4, uh, the entry receptor used by MERS-CoV, uh, one second, allowed SARS, uh, okay, that part is their own again. Allowed Correct. SARS to S. Uh, I, I, I think what I think I get what Niketa is hmm. trying to say that this part, which is what is DPP four, huh. is from previous work. Yeah. What is APN is from, from previous, previous, previous work. work, and the rest of the sentence seems the, to be the author's own. Author's. Huh. Um, Niketa, am I am I correct in saying that? Yes. Right. Thank you. So I'm just going to do the highlighting bit. So in a lot of ways, these are like definitions, right, Shanta? Exactly. The, and, you know, just not, not, they're not just definitions. If you also look, because they are comparing SARS-CoV, the novel coronavirus with three other, other viruses, they are saying that DPP-4 is something that is used by MERS-CoV, mm -hmm. which is a different respiratory disease, mm -hmm. the virus. So it's, right. it's both the definition of DPP-4, but it is also the function of DPP-4. Right, right. So which has been found to... by someone else. Correct. So right. similarly, APN, there is another coronavirus, which is 229E, and that uses something called APN to infect cells. They are saying that, no, this SARS-CoV-2 is different from both MERS-CoV 
and human coronavirus 229e because it is not infecting through dpp4 or apm but the fact that mers cov infects through dpp4 or 229e infects through apm is something that they know from pre existing work does does that make sense yeah and what is actually very interesting for me here is how you know this uh, the color coding has given this result where you have this pink and green and pink and green it's almost like something is you know knitting together of exactly. uh, their own and the sources uh, saying yeah. so, uh, so let's just the... finish sorry let's just finish whatever sentences we have left and we'll get to see the paragraph in some better light moreover anti serum and by the way anti serum is just antibodies so don't spend so much time thinking about it anti serum raised against human ace2 blocked sars s and sars 2s but not vsvg or mers s driven entry so is there anything that has come from previous work here doesn't look like absolutely no. so this is completely yeah. the author's own work finally authentic sars cov2 which is actual coronavirus is infected uh, bhk21 cells transfected to express ace2 but not parental bhk bhk21 cells with high efficiency again does does there look like there's something that's coming from previous work here no 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 correct so this is also um the author's own work so now like preetha was pointing out you see an interspersing of evidence that has been generated by the authors themselves and evidence that comes from pre existing research and i want us to pause here for a bit and think about how have the authors arranged these different pieces of evidence to arrive at an argument and see that the argument is actually at the end saying the argument is an extremely simple one which is that SARS-CoV-2, this novel coronavirus, infects cells using ACE2, and if you can stop ACE2 SARS coronavirus interaction, you might be able to prevent the infection. That's it. The argument is something that's extremely simple, but there is so much work that has gone behind this, also indicating some of the mess that has gone into doing this research. These experiments are happening. in different labs across 13 research institutions but being put together to lead us to an argument quite literally the argument actually arrives after the evidence has been spread out so i'm i would love it if people could unmute themselves or put their put it in the chat about how you think this interspersing is working so as you pointed out chantan in your previous slide where there was one quote one big chunk mm -hmm. of quote that martin used and there was a setting up and there was an analysis and the work itself was happening in the paragraph here the work seems to have happened earlier is just indicating what that work was and if i remember right there's a huge so even though the paper is only 6 pages there's a huge list of where to find different material references that that's like a, that's the rest of the i think 7 8 pages that there is so there seems to be a disciplinary difference here uh, in how what work paragraphs are doing yeah. between uh, scientific papers and how the social sciences and in fact not just anthropology mm. but other social sciences literary critics yeah. how they are writing paragraphs and what work paragraphs are doing seems to be yeah. generically different you you correct you correct um i want to respond to the questions that have come up from nikita yeah. and samir mm -hmm. because i think that might also help us think about the paragraph in in an interesting context so firstly i am very happy to hear that it now seems seamless but this seamlessnessness nikita is what we are trying to hint at is a product of writing the fact that the authors have actually interspersed pre existing research and their own work in the same sentences in the same paragraph is the reason why now it 
it is it is appearing seamless and which is why we do look at text so closely you know once you do this highlighting and you know uh, maybe a side note but i do think it's a very good practice to develop to actually use different colors of highlights to start reading paragraphs because then a science paper like this which many of us had no idea about for that matter i am not a virologist i have no idea unless i start delving into this further the process of highlighting does help you know arrive at uh, this and so if I, mean, i may add to just what you said shadon quickly also mm-hmm. like we were talking about close reading in yesterday's class this is also where close reading comes in for instance uh, something like the phrase in contrast or in agreement with the findings so there is the, the fact that this interspersing what we are saying it is not just random interspersing but also there are certain kind of relationships being built certain type Absolutely. of connections being built between the different forms of evidence the present evidence and the past evidence absolutely and tomorrow samir is going to talk uh, yes. more about connections so uh, might be useful then um samir you asked a great question which is can the fi- final sentence be considered the thesis statement of the paper this is a great point for me to point out samir that the thesis statement of the paper is its title if you remember the title of the paper let me just pull it out it says that human that sars cov2 cell entry depends on ace2 what we just saw a paragraph um, leading towards that and tmpr ss2 and is blocked by a clinically proven protease inhibitor that appears right at the beginning the thesis statement of the paper is literally its title but what you might think that the the part in cyan is the final statement is the claim for this paragraph is the point that this paragraph is making and it is a kind of peculiar organization like ananya was pointing out because um as we'll very soon see that often in social science and humanities papers you see the argument appearing first and the evidence appearing later but in the science paper like polomi's writing uh, polomi's telling us that the topic sentence is asking a question is telling us about what the authors want to investigate why do they want to do it and then there's a thread of evidence a trail of evidence and this trail of evidence is a trail which is mixing our pre-existing evidence and our novel evidence and literally leading us to the claim so so this is this is great thank you to niketa samir and polomi for for these insights now i do want to move to a paragraph from martin's paper because we've already breached the question of disciplinary differences in writing of a paragraph and like i just said the part highlighted in cyan the sentence highlighted in cyan ovulation does not merit enthusiasm in these texts as compared with spermatogenesis is the argument that martin is making and the rest of the paragraph works with evidence is is substantiating the argument that has been made so now i'd like to open this question to all of you and especially people who are responding are coming from humanities and the social sciences why don't we think together why is it that there is the argument that's coming first and the evidence is followed and let's just try to do this for some time and then there's of course a more profound question waiting at the end like you see at the bottom of the slide which is about the process of writing but slow steps baby steps not baby hamster steps it seems <laughs> baby hamster steps yeah just to bell over the question the question is that the claim seems to appear first the argument seems to appear first in the paragraph and is followed by evidence while in the previous paragraph our evidence led to the argument 
but i hope all of you are with me in saying that it is not that martin came up with the argument first and then chose evidence that's not how good research happens martin did work with the evidence analyzed it reached at the argument and seems to have decided to put the argument at the beginning and then the evidence i'm just trying to pick your brains to see why you think martin might have done that uh polubi says it's just a way of writing or argumentation good good start polubi yeah. i'm i'm just trying to sort of push you to think why is it that we like this way of writing i think so wasif has yeah. hand up yeah. wasif would you like to unmute yourself yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah the sense that i'm getting uh you know going through both these slides is like the science paper it seems as if the paper is telling me uh these things and getting me to this argument it's like a telling whereas when uh, we did this the particular slide that we have up now is is i guess in a way showing me like you know how we arrive at that i guess i don't know it's like yeah uh, that's the sense okay 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 uh samir says martin's evidence is more analysis based while the cell paper wants to quantify evidence yeah i i i differ slightly there because yeah. even the cell paper arrives at that statements all through analysis i mean those graphs in the figures and there are several figures are all a result of analysis um but i do like wasif's point of showing versus telling right science paper is actually like wasif said it's giving us a lecture on why sars cov2 infects through ac2 or how does sars cov2 cause an infection and that comes from the way that science works which is that scientists are these producers of knowledge and the readers of science are receivers of knowledge and this product producer versus receiver bridge leads to this kind of if i may say preachy communication in in some sense um yeah but, I, i have some responses here uh polumi yeah. says depends on the expectations of disciplinary readers that's a great point polumi and in fact i do want to focus on this a little bit more that even more than disciplinary reader it's generally the fact that you're writing your research means that you're writing it to be read and often times it is during the process of revision that we take this step to transform our paper into a more readable paper so in the first draft you are a writer and you are writing for yourself you are writing to figure it out so there is a high possibility that martin's argument did appear at the end of this paragraph in the first draft because martin was figuring it out but once you figured it out for yourself it is during the process of revision and drafting that you want to figure out what makes it easier for my reader to read the paper and therefore martin puts the argument right at the beginning of the paragraph and tells ki here is why i make this argument uh shantan one more just conjecture from my end uh, is it something to throw back on what you were telling us about the difference between the source and evidence uh, the fact that the way scientific evidence is presented directly that processed product is what we are getting in the paper whereas in the uh, humanity social sciences in this case the anthropology paper we see the process of arriving the conversion of the source to an evidence the setup of the code the code the analysis of the code so on and so forth all the things that you told us uh, is that probably one of the reasons which also probably connects to what wasif yeah. is saying about showing versus telling yeah um so no, i i would say that it's partly correct so in the sense that you do see processing has also happened in martin's paper and i remember there is a footnote in martin's paper where martin says that i had a lot more arguments to work with and i decided not to use with them because of lack of space so coherence is being developed 
is being processed through the several drafts of each paragraph, each sentence, the entire paper that is happening. But what you want to think about is the kind of processing. The processing that Martin is doing is a processing through writing. Yeah. So she's figuring out through writing. But the scientists are not processing through writing. They are using some quantitative tool to transform numerical data into graphs, let's say. Now, there is a second processing. Sorry, finish and then I'll. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I was saying that there's a second step of processing that happens when you transform that graph into language, into a sentence, writing. into writing. And then for science, writing becomes an act of communication, not an act of figuring things out. For Martin, the writing is an act of figuring things out. Anana, you were saying something. I was Sorry. saying that I wouldn't say that the scientists are not uh, using writing to figure out what they have to say. In fact, Pritha, I know, is going to use in her presentation some writing from lab notebooks. Right? So where the writing for processing and where the writing for figuring out is happening, and that's what I think Vasiv was asking right at the very beginning. You know, the process of research is not without writing. It's just that you're writing different things at different times. Sometimes you're writing notes. Sometimes you're writing drafts of papers. And as Shainthan, I think Shainthan pointed out something very important earlier. So when you are drafting a paper and writing a paragraph for the first time, and you don't know what your claim is, how many of you find yourself in a position when you sit down to write that you don't know what your argument is, or you don't know what the claim in a paragraph is going to be, because we don't start with all of that, right? So we start with, I don't know, but here's some interesting data, or here's some, here's an interesting quotation that's really catching my attention, let me work with it. And as I do, what I have to say emerges towards the end of the paragraph or the end of the paper sometimes, a draft sometimes, you would have all experienced this. But in the final presentation, you know, uh, Emily Martin actually thanks her anonymous reviewers. She thanks her brilliant editor. Now, there might be the editorial feedback which says, no, put this on top. It will be easier to read. So as Shainpan said, you know, the final, final polished paper is one that is meant to make it easy for readers to read and does not actually show us the process, uh, you know, in the final, and this is the irony of, I think, published writing, that published writing is going to hide the messiness of the process. We don't know how many drafts this took. It could have taken 21 drafts for all we know, right? So what was going on in all those drafts that we don't see anymore, right? So Vas, if I, this is, goes back to what you're saying, and I do want to press the point that it's not like the writing is only happening in this final draft, right? Different kinds of writing have happened before, whether the scientists are doing it or social scientists are doing it, how you are taking notes, how you are arriving at the points, what feedback you are getting is happening at a different place. And it's getting arranged in a particular way, depending on what the generic requirements of an academic essay is in different disciplines. Uh, just wanted to highlight that that point if it's okay, Shantar. No, no, of course it's it's okay. So um, yeah, so I think the profound question that I had out here has already been answered, which is what does this tell us about the process of writing? And what does this tell us is that the process of writing is an iterative process and is a process that helps us figure things out. And, and we are going to talk more about it during the Q&A. I just want to quickly summarize our key learnings from this presentation. One is that research is a messy process across disciplines, as we have all understood and agreed. And during the course of research, researchers generate a lot of data. A lot of analysis goes on to generating this data evidence. But lining up evidence lets us construct a narrative. And I think Polomi is the one in the beginning sort of started us with the question of narrative. And this narrative, this lining up of evidence, the fact that it's building up to something, takes us to an argument. It helps us arrive at an argument. And the process of writing facilitates this process of lining up evidence to arrive at an argument. It's not that writing is a merely expository process that just communicates work that has happened, analysis that has happened and brings it to a reader. But the fact that people write 
to figure out their argument from the evidence that they have generated and it is through multiple iterations revisions and the process of editing and feedback that you get the final neat coherent sorted feeling that hides all the messiness of research simply because you want your reader who might not be interested in the messiness of research to be able to understand what you're trying to say with that i would like to thank you for being such a wonderful audience and i'm happy to take questions comments or suggestions should i stop sharing the screen just so that i can see all of you and was it say something very important i think but just to remember that the process of writing is not a seamless one is something we need to tell ourselves uh, so uh, yeah i yeah, think that's yeah. true for all of us us if we need to tell this to ourselves not once but many many times but we also need to remember that the process of writing although messy and difficult no unseamless is also geared towards making our product the writing at the end seamless and there is merit in indulging in this difficult and exhausting process because we'll produce work that we difficult exhausting and joyous process yeah because i was going to come to that which is that when you see that final product you're going to feel very happy and hopefully proud of so it's just a nice battle you know there's a for the lit folks out there but also others there's a poem by w b yeats called adam's curse if you're familiar with it and that poem is basically this that you know uh, so according to christian mythology adam and eve when they fell from heaven they were cursed to work so adam in eden did not have to work but once thrown out of eden was cursed to work and had to work for a living so that's the adam's curse and yeats is talking about people who do physical work and he says that you know you can see if somebody is building a road or a bridge you can see what work they are doing how much sweat and labor they are putting into it and how that bridge is built but then what about the poet the poet stitches and unstitches a line many many times so that by the end of it it doesn't show the labor at all right so do look up the poem if you get a chance it's exactly the process i think that chantan was uh, taking us through um uh, uh so yeah you might uh, you might find that of interest the poem is called adam's curse i mean if you could all talk about you know i didn't realize shantan i was giving away the answer to the profound question i just got <laughs> so engrossed in your uh, presentation that i forgot to keep shut but you know we have talked about the writing process from our point of view and you know we heard wasif talk about that samir a little bit follow me a little bit if others want to talk about that process that first slide where shantan invited you know what is your research process what are the challenges if you would go back to that think about it and share your observations with us i think that would be really useful for us as well yeah i would like to ask uh, santan datta um, like can we adopt this kind of uh, strategy in humanities also in our paper research paper in humanities lining up evidence first yeah preferably not i mean in the sense that i must say that while i'm using the science paper do notice that even the science paper gives the argument right in the beginning so the title is the argument of the paper it's only in individual paragraphs that the evidence comes first and the claim comes later and i must say that that is not a very good way of writing as you could very well see the moment preetha started reading it out it was so difficult for us to follow along for several of us so um i think the the point about actually putting that claim right in the beginning the argument in the beginning and the evidence later is that it makes it easier for your reader to engage with your paragraph and in your first draft you should definitely do it the way you feel comfortable because that draft is for you to understand what you want to write um in your final draft preferably 
flip the order, put the argument and write it in a way that your reader thinks, okay, this is what my author is saying and here's why my author is saying so. Uh, also, I would like to add here that uh, whether at the scope of the entire paper, that is absolutely true that in the introduction, somewhere we let our readers know what to expect of the paper at the realm of the individual paragraphs. I think there is scope for experimentation. Uh, in fact, uh, the Vedic's chapter that has been circulated is one great example of such writing where there's the almost storytelling like laying out of evidence. And after the laying out of evidence, it is being, you know, analyzed and the eventually whatever argument has to be reached is reaching. So and I don't think it's a what yeah. yeah. Things often do that. that yeah, they yeah. Of the narrative first and then Bhavani Raman also we use a lot and she does the same yeah. thing. So there is room for variation from discipline to discipline. The way to deal with it would be to see what, you know, some of the best sort of writers in our field are doing and sort of learn from that. Uh, Polumi is making a very interesting point. Polumi, why don't you unmute and uh, uh, tell I think us? I will need to do that uh, for her. Okay, uh, Pritha is unmuting you, so we would love to hear you say what you're saying. I think Polomi had said she cannot unmute herself. Like now she no, I am. I'm doing it. Yeah. No, I yes. think that cannot is that she like doesn't want to unmute herself. No, no, no. Oh, okay. I, I no, no, she's unable. None of the no one had the permission initially. Yeah, yeah. Today. No. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Shainton. Uh, like we have I have been reading Martin's paper so many times, I've you just used it in my class as well. But connecting that paper to something so scientific and still seeing those pa like similar patterns was very, very helpful today. And uh, most importantly, to think that even when we are teaching students who are maybe from science backgrounds, there's still something uh, very, very valuable to, to still see in the process of argumentation. And that's what I meant like uh, when, when we say, that uh, the scientist is writing the question and the answer. It's almost like in the first sentence there's a question and the last sentence is an answer. So things didn't, they, they weren't so neat to begin with. The scientist's process is also mess messy. Martin's process is also messy. It's just that Martin is kind of using a hook sentence, a topic sentence to catch on to the uh, reader's attention right away. And the scientist is slowly revealing like a story, like uh, for a, fairy tale or slowly building up okay this is the question do we have an answer yes do we have an answer so that's the slow leading uh, different styles of writing depending on the kind of audiences that uh, the, the readers that we expect our disciplines to have or our papers to have so that's one observation and the second thing is normalizing this uh, messiness and labor and inability to write uh, the very fact that we get stuck with the writing doesn't mean we are not doing enough research Sometimes it's uh, it, it just needs maybe another eye, a feedback, and that's where I'll go back to the collaborative process that you were hinting in today's workshop in the beginning, that sometimes it needs another person to read your text and tell you how to make it work. Because sometimes we are so into our work, we don't see something which is just there. So, yeah, so those were very, very important observations. And sometimes great professors and um, like teachers in our classrooms they make uh, like this they, they they kind of project writing to be just as okay you're ready you start writing so um it seems uh, seamless but that's not the real story so this behind the camera work is something that needs to be normalized it's like we need to know that great professors also struggle with writing but then we don't hear enough people talking about it yeah. i think <laughs> yeah. And also not just going back to to add to what Polomi is saying, not just going back to the our collaborators, which is a brilliant uh, way of looking at it, but also to the evidence. Today, entire day, we are talking exactly. about evidence, right? Like sometimes uh, it's just useful when we are stuck with writing to maybe just go back to the evidence and look at it afresh and see, okay, did I miss something? Is there some other pattern? Is there some connection we Absolutely. are missing? Absolutely. And I think, yeah. Yeah. So, so looking for evidences is also a collaborative process. It's just that you're not doing with real people, but you're doing it with 
material that's already written exactly, by scholars exactly. before you, right? So that's exactly. also collaboration. It's Fantastic. just that when you are showing it to your peers or your teachers, you are just meeting real people out there and getting their feedback. So it's just that texts don't talk back. So you take them and you may read them whatever way you want. But when you are uh, working with uh, peers for a collaborative work or taking their feedback and incorporating that uh, feedback in your work, if it's useful, then I think uh, it just uh, makes this process much more dynamic and manageable and, and real rather than just uh, hoping one fine morning I'll wake up and that news will arrive and our writing will flow. And that's not the real story. I think that that needs to be spoken more about. So that's what I wanted to mean. It, yeah. While we are on the question of challenges, uh, Dr. Nitali B. Kumar from Gargaon College had given us a list right at the very beginning. And I'd like to read that. And is, is Dr. Nitali here? Uh, in case Dr. Nitali is here, you know, we'd, we'd love to sort of go back to the points she made. And I'll start uh, reading some of those out and it might resonate with everybody. And this has to do with ultimately our, our sense that can we write up everything or not, right? So what are the challenges? Lack of motivation, lack of self-confidence, time management, uh, focus or direction, limited support, stuck in your comfort zone, fear of failure or taking risk, lack of relevant experience. And these are such important points, right? And you know, that seamlessness that Shantan talked about that, you know, it looks so neat in a published paper. The fact that the scholars who wrote it might at the, you know, in their lives have some of these things going on as it happens to all of us, right? So not getting enough time or resources, uh, not feeling sure, can I make that argument? Many of us find ourselves, you know, uh, I pointed out that place in Martin where she's being damn sarcastic, that, oh, this is just kept on a shelf, like overstock inventory. Most of us are not going to feel confident to write like that because, you know, Martin is a, you know, big deal scholar, she can say whatever, right? So these are, I think, real issues, real challenges, and they affect the way that we read and write. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nitali, for bringing these up. And, uh, you know, if, if Shantan or someone wants to think about any one of these points, say, stuck in your comfort zone. So, so let's take up that problem and this FDP that has been organized, where, you know, we, Shantan made us read some scientific stuff that I know that I would never read on my own. My comfort zone is Aga Shahid Ali's Ghazal. Leave me there, I will live there happily. <laughs> I would have but never I, read it either. Like Shantan, so what, you know, this, this being stuck in our comfort zone, so what did I learn from what Shantan had to teach me and will that make me a better literary critic? I'm not going to become a science writer tomorrow, but will it make me a better writer in what I'm writing? I think that's the other question that we might ask ourselves. And Shantan, if you have a response to that or any, anybody else, we'd be happy to take that. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, the question of comfort zone uh, in academia, it's the, this question of being stuck in our disciplinary boundaries, right? And we love our disciplines so much. We actually overlove our disciplines to the point that they incapacitate us from writing more. We end up becoming such big scholars of literary critique that we don't write anymore. We end up becoming such big scientists that we produce data for 10 years in the lab and don't write a paper about it. I think that's also this why there's this push towards interdisciplinary work because it makes you breach your comfort zone, engage with scholars of other disciplines, and hopefully, you know, get something out of the work that's publicly funded and that's constantly happening and especially for scientists in, you know this paper if this was not not happening during the time of a pandemic would be a classic virology paper and so there are people who call themselves corona virologists they just study coronaviruses and only coronaviruses right so it's micro specific in terms of what they are doing um, so yeah, I think one way of breaking out of your comfort zone is to actually break it, break out of your disciplinary boundary. 
engage with other disciplines and see what they are doing because a lot of my work now is so much influenced by philosophy of science anthropology of science sociology of science please say although also please say poetry yeah yeah definitely <laughs> haiku <definitely laughs> haiku of course and that's because and and that's and this is really interesting right because i have for the most part of my life i've been a very traditional hardcore neuroscientist somebody who's actually chopping brains up the whole day and poking into them so yeah I and you mean that literally right i mean that literally. <laughs> I, i mean it as literally as baby hamster kidney cells when you kill a baby hamster you take out its kidney and you take its cells out i think polomi wants to add something yeah. uh, polomi please go ahead yeah so uh, just adding to the conversation about uh, tackling the problems the list of problems that ananya was talk- talking about and we have another participant who's put that out so the, these problems of lack of motivation not being confident about our research uh, or unsure about trying something new uh, to write about when i know my phd has been on that topic am i am i confident enough to start writing about something else do i know enough so uh, th- this is this is from an experience i had recently over the pandemic years one and a half year uh, so this uh, journal of dramatic theory and criticism and uh, global performance studies they collaboratively asked for uh, collaborative papers they they insisted on collaborative papers from performance like from the field of performance now we all know that performance is something which happens collaboratively but interestingly writings about performance don't happen collaboratively so they wanted to kind of pitch that it's like why is that writing suddenly become such an isolatory process and let's see if you can make it work so it from it's from the uh, point of view of that abstract that i reached out to two of my friends and we stuck with a common theme and then we started looking does this theme has pat- has have patterns in all the kinds of work that we've done and and believe me had it not been a collaborative process it wouldn't have been possible to work in a pandemic year and come out with a publication and now that it is out i have my professor calling me and telling that uh, the very fact that performance studies can also write collaboratively is something that we are learning from you because and this is a very interesting uh, comment that one of my professors said is that i think we have big egos that's why we don't collaborate <laughs> and it, that never occurred to me because for me i'm i'm a starter so i have no ego to start with right so i like i learn from everyone even my students so when he told me that i was like oh okay so that's also another thing why we don't collaborate but this entire process actually helped uh kind of navigate all the lack of motivation because yes in this time one of my collaborators one of my friends uh, she lost her father to the pandemic uh i i got pandemic i lost one of my family members to the pandemic so all of this while was happening so it's enough reason to lose motivation enough reason not to push through but still when two of us are not ready someone says we haven't met for long let us write that again so that thing kept on happening and i think that's one of the reasons why even social sciences should look for collaborators and not just scientists who are working together we know that all scientists work together in the labs so lab work is definitely not solitary so yeah just an experience that i had to share and another thing is that any writing that's coming from the south asia often and when it's culture driven uh, gets a very white uh, hegemonic feedback so what will be the spelling of kerala or keralam uh, whether i should uh, use something in italics or not so these kind of comments had i been a sole author maybe in the urge of getting published i would have agreed to everything but the very fact that we were three voices we sat down and we argued about every comment that that feedback got and we took very bold steps and we responded to each of their questions but we said yes that's what uh, i understand where it's coming from but we don't agree i think i could say that aloud because i had three voices to begin with i was not alone had i been alone i would have kind of uh, bent my head and said okay okay i need a publication do whatever you want go ahead publish it right so i think that comes from a uh, kind of a multiple voice place where i know okay we can try this Uh, if it doesn't work at a point we were also thinking okay agar is paper mein nahi hoga we'll get it published somewhere this is this is good work if they they are not happy we'll take it somewhere else but that confidence comes from collaboration i think yeah so just a experience i wanted to share 
thank you thank you so much and that's wonderful to hear polomi i just wanted to say that um i don't want anybody here to be under the impression that scientists don't have big egos even though they collaborate <laughs> i just wanted to say that scientists with big egos collaborate with scientists with big egos and publish a cell paper scientists with small egos collaborate with people with small egos and publish a current science paper so i mean we are working with a cell paper only because it is a cell paper but uh, i'm just wanted to say that it's not that scientists don't have egos you should look at some of these self publishing scientists Okay. that brings me to a point uh, which is a great lead in into our next session tomorrow that samir will be uh, conducting and i'll give samir just a minute to hint what's coming for tomorrow and not readings perhaps uh, you should be ready with is that you know egos and everything aside and we know no bigger egos than academics maybe there are but within academia we know that that's that that's something that we're dealing with but all of that sort of even melts away when you're actually writing when you're actually analyzing text and it, if it has to work if it has to make a real contribution to knowledge as this paper did this paper possibly made it uh, easier to reach the mra vaccine conclusions and to have those vaccines coming right um uh, and this is so no matter what mess and including the egos the actual work involves people from and even i was looking at the list chatan there were psychologists virologists there were uh, people who worked with apes there were people who worked with humans there were actually it's not even just one discipline if you look at that list of institutions departments and centers you see all kinds of people coming together to do the work which brings us to a very important question and we've been doing this in this workshop right from day one is we seem to be taking sources from different places uh you know poetry with science with the uh, history paper science paper uh, we are we are constantly bringing all these different sources together in one presentation and you know there were questions about why are you picking these things and not others which brings us to the question of you know this how do you when you bring all these sources together that don't seem to be automatically connected uh, how do you make those connections because it seems new knowledge lies in the ability to connect things where other people don't see connections so the question is you know the the phd when you're doing your uh, the plan is that you will be given your degree if you make a new contribution to your field how do you produce new knowledge and new knowledge basically means you've seen and said something that nobody else saw uh, uh, and said how do you do that that seem does it come out of thin air or does it come from basically putting sources together in a way that other people didn't think to do right so that leads me to samir and tomorrow's workshop <clears throat> on connections so samir just give us an idea tell us what reading so people can come prepared with that sure ananya uh, so as is mentioned uh, you know uh, you know I, I, what ananya just said we're going to look at connections in the next session and how they can help us develop our arguments and make our uh, research or the research paper that we write uh, more complex the readings we'll be using for that are uh, emily martin's the egg and the sperm which we've uh, used today as well uh, and the other one is uh, satyagrahi to krantikari by aparna vedik uh, so that's a slightly longish reading but it's been circulated uh please do try to read that and mb martin of course yeah. thank you samir thank you so much so, uh, so uh, i just want to uh, add uh, i have this observation regarding uh, collaboration across disciplines so um, i think i personally uh, or many of us have this like a fear to mm -hmm. go into a different area so i had this uh, one of my colleagues asked me recently to collaborate write a research paper he belongs to economics and also uh, i have friends uh, from sociology so sometimes there is this fear of um, like working together uh, because we have this pressure of publishing papers in our own disciplines 
um, so we fear that it might not work out so and we also don't know how to collaborate uh, work together because we come from literature and how can we write a paper um, with someone from economics mm -hmm. so uh, we are confused in that manner so I think uh, workshops of this kind will help us to enlighten on these aspects so regarding um, yeah just to respond quickly to what you said, Shamulima. Mm -hmm. In fact, this baby hamster kidney that uh, Shantan was telling uh, us about uh, over and over again, it automatically what came to mind, if I was like an ethics scholar, a philosophy scholar, I would immediately want to collaborate with them to see like, you know, how one thinks about the, you know, ethics of it all. Like, uh, yes, on one hand, you have coronavirus and we know what havoc it is creating in the world in terms of human loss of lives but at the same time you know the amount of animals which are mentioned in that paper who have sacrificed their lives for us to get this insight that there's a protein and with which the, the, the receptor needs to be blocked for coronavirus to be somehow uh, in like that to stop the flow uh, I, I, I think that is a collaboration, right? That there itself, it's a collaboration. It's a philosophy and science collaboration there. Yeah, that's a nice observation. So this workshop really opens our eyes to new aspects, to new areas. So regarding today's session, uh, I really, uh, we really enjoyed this because uh, Santan is very he has so much of clarity while explaining things and he explains in slow gradual steps then um, even though uh, he's explaining a science text uh, we are able to understand and uh, definitely this um, way of using evidence to build up an effective argument uh, is a great way and um, also the other strategies uh, these are necessary for structuring a research work and really it, but it was wonderful so moving on, uh, I now ask uh, Dr. Rashmi Datta, who is an assistant professor in geology from Gorgon College to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening and a warm greetings to everyone present here. I, on behalf of organizing committee, would like to express my Heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Sainjan Dutta, Faculty Teaching Associate at the CWP Korea University for engaging this session as well as for enlightening the knowledge on the team, a trial of evidence leading to the argument on third day of one week faculty development program on academic reading and writing. It was indeed a pleasure listening to you throughout the session and learn about different aspects of reading and how it affects on writing and hope that in future, we get to listen to you more. So thank you on our behalf. I would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Anayana Dasgupta Ma'am, Director, CWP, Korea University. I would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Shamorima Sarkia Ma'am for coordinating this session and last but not least, I would like to express my gratitude to our participants and faculty members from across the country for their active participation and hoping to meet you all in our next session. Thank you. Tomorrow is two to four again, right? Again, okay. and the same link. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the participants. Thank you to the resource person. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Uh, Shamalima, I think someone was asking for the feedback link on yeah, yeah. your chat. So I think uh, we, we will give, be giving the feedback uh, on the, the WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Yeah. Okay. And okay. also mail it too. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chalo. Okay. I'm leaving. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.